Let's pray. Father God, we ask that we will listen. We ask that you open our hearts and we ask that we'll be ready to receive anything and everything that you have. Thank you, Father. Amen. Now, Martin's just read to us that passage um, from Philippians where we heard Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. It, this is the path of kenosis. It means to empty, to, to let go. He could have come as the king of kings with all the power, riches, and privilege that go with this position, but instead, he denied what was his by right. He just let it go. He consciously chose a life of powerlessness, poverty, servanthood, so that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came into this broken world as one of us. We were created in his image and likeness in order to increase faith, hope, and love in this broken world. We either live the lives we have in order to build up this world in love, or we add to its brokenness. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. We are called to follow him, to participate in this process. However, sooner or later, we'll find ourselves in situations which we can't fix, control, explain, or even understand. And this may actually be where you are now. Such is life. However, Jesus says, do not be anxious about your life. Really? When stuff happens which is absurd, tragic, unjust, he says, don't be anxious? Well, just reflect back on this very strange year. You can see some of it there on, on the screen. We've had earthquakes, floods, extremes of cold, extremes of heat, wildfires. More recently, there's been the Afghanistan. You know, you think, what is going on? It's very odd, awful. These global events are awful. But generally, they don't touch us on a personal level because stuff like that doesn't happen, certainly not on that scale, in this country in the UK, we generally speaking, we don't experience this kind of stuff. But there are things that we do. Obviously, COVID affected everybody. That was global. Suffering in general, illness, death, financial hardship, these things have happened and are happening. And this stuff, this is the stuff that hurts because this is personal. And Jesus says, do not be anxious. It sounds contradictory. It doesn't entirely make sense. The psalmist talks about the bread of anxious toil. Isaiah refers to the anxious heart. Now, this is the anxiety that consumes in anticipation of, or the dread that overwhelms in the midst of. It can be as if you're saying to God, you don't see me. You don't understand. You don't care. And God declares over and over again, I see, I understand, I care. Now, it's important to read that passage in Matthew in its particular context, in the context of the Bible narrative, and of course, in the light of who Jesus actually is. He never trivialized either the person or their suffering, quite the reverse. He came to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He saw, he understood, he cared. So that passage in Matthew concluded with this statement. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, and don't we know it? But the question is, what do we do about it? How do we manage those areas of our lives where we can seemingly do something? Well, one possibility is that we take back control. Now, this may not be a total takeover. It very much depends on the circumstances and, of course, on personality. 
but I wonder if you recognize any aspects of this person. Um, it could be someone at work. It could be someone in your family. It could be someone in this church. The difficulty is, is that if this is you, you won't recognize this person at all. But you might, as you sit, you might be reflecting on your high standards and expectations, on your attention to detail, and your unique and sometimes unacknowledged leadership skills. It's a difficult package to manage this one, and it comes, it's a spectrum. It may not be every aspect, it may be sort of dipping in and out. Let me give you a very minor example from my own experience, very trivial, housework. Um, I regard housework as a necessary evil. I like our home to be clean and uncluttered, and therefore there are things that I have to do. It's just the nature of the beast. Now, there are some people, on the other hand, who view housework as a war of attrition, to be completed to a particular standard and according to a fixed timetable, resulting in question, and this is a real conversation, well, interrogation, really. Um, th this, this actually happened quite recently. The conversation went like this. Don't you have a window cleaner? Uh, how often do you clean your windows? And do you want me to clean them for you? Now, this is a real conversation. And my answers were, uh, no, I don't have a window cleaner. I actually have no idea the last time I cleaned my windows. And no, you're not cleaning them. Um, apparently, you can judge the cleanliness of a house just using two little tricks, the windows and the skirting boards. Now, I fail on a regular basis on both of those, of those two areas. Now, this is quite trivial. I, I know it is. But sometimes, taking control, making the assumption that you're in the right can be destructive and debilitating both for the person themselves and for those within their sphere of influence, you know, their partner, their family, uh, the, the church. Perhaps there are times when we just need to sit at the Lord's feet, listening, rather than being distracted and irritated. Now, I want you to consider this man. Now, just about everything I'm about to say at this point is my opinion. Okay, this is not gospel. This is, this is my thinking on this man. It's speculation. There is very little biblical data about him other than that he was one of the 12 disciples, he betrayed Jesus, and then he hanged himself. Now, the disciples seem to be totally incredulous. How could he do it? He was one of them. He was a beloved disciple. How could he do such a terrible thing. And you know, it's always bothered me as well. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, the only possible explanation the gospel writers could come up with was greed. Apparently, he would dip into the communal purse. And of course, there was the lure of those 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is where this is my opinion, okay? This is purely my opinion. I think the clue is in the name Judas Iscariot. It's not a surname that they didn't exist as such. It's a corruption of a word sicarius, which means murderer, assassin, sometimes translated knife bearer, depends which translation you use. Now the sicarii were the most radical of the Jewish freedom fighters. Now this is where my theory comes in. Jesus, Judas genuinely believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He'd seen Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead, feed the masses, how could he not believe? Jesus, the Messiah, would establish the kingdom of God. That was the promise. Now this was the right time and this was the right place and Judas had a plan. He would be the catalyst. He could accelerate the process and force Jesus' hand. No more nonsense about servanthood or death. The kingdom was about to be initiated. Now, I think Judas confused and conflated the kingdom of God with the kingdom of Israel. It's an easy mistake to make. And it wasn't until Jesus was condemned and then handed over to Pilate for execution that he actually understood. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But this was too little, 
too late. He couldn't control these events. He was wrong. Earlier in scripture, King David had instructed Solomon, his son, know the God of your father, serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If only Judas had remembered those words. If only we remembered those words. God is not hiding from us. He knows your circumstances, your concerns, your needs. If you seek him, he will be found by you. However, Proverb warns us, don't boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring. Plans and preparations are all very well, but sometimes stuff happens that just can't be anticipated. James adds a little rider. He says this, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this and that. You boast in your arrogance. Now, this is not a magic formula. Adding the phrase, Lord willing, doesn't make the thing that you want happen. It's not magic. It's simply a way of reminding you that your plans and your assumptions aren't necessarily God's. It might help occasionally if we asked. And we're going to finish with a prayer which has been adapted from um, a book that we've been reading, Scattered Servants, by Alan Scott. So I've changed a few of the words, but basically this is the prayer. And then we're going to say a prayer together. He says this, let's join God on the journey of bringing life to this town, to Warminster. Demonstrate the power of God beyond this building. Now that phrase has been used a few times this morning. Beyond this building. Discover the dreams God has put in our hearts for the sake of this town. Move on in faith and move out with God's blessing. Understand our identity and unlock our authority. Develop a faith that isn't just strong enough to survive culture, but bold enough to transform it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Father, forgive us for the times when we insist our will be done. Give us the strength and the courage to live our lives to your praise and glory. When things are at their worst, help us to say, yet not I will, but what you will. Amen. And if you can, if we can stand together and say these words to each other, but to ourselves primarily. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, but through transcending, will God your hearts and minds.